everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Build Bar, and we'll be tackling the very popular and controversial weight loss program known as Bright Line Eating. I have avoided this one for a while now because this one kind of messed with my mind, but it's finally time I broke my silence. Nah, I'm just with you guys. I just get a lot of requests because there is a lot of wellness bull to debunk. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Build Bar. Guys, these are good. Like, these are really, really good. I don't usually like protein bars. I mean, I don't like chalk masquerading as food, but I like these bars. They taste like chocolate, but bonus, they've got a lot of protein in them. So today's flavor, busting into a fresh box, feels so good. You gotta sing it. Mm. <gasps> I don't know if I've tried this. Brownie peanut butter, what? I mean, talk about two amazing worlds colliding. This would be so good on like yogurt or sometimes what I do is like I melt it in the microwave for like 10 seconds and then I put whipped cream on top. Yeah, I usually have one before bed, but if I were to do this as like a post-workout snack, I would probably throw in some fruit or some oats. This would be really good on oats as well. So if you wanna try these out yourself, check out the link in my description and use my promo code ABBYSHARP15 for 15% off of your order. Also, before we dive deeper into reviewing this program, I wanna provide a quick disclaimer, which you can find on screen and in the description below, including a trigger warning, since we will be talking about restrictive eating behaviors. Also, this video is not meant to shame anyone who may use bright line eating or who may have in the past. This is simply my review of the program and my professional opinions about its claims. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on an episode. Okay, folks. If you are not familiar with Bright Line Eating, AKA BLE, it's a weight loss program founded by Susan Pierce Thompson, a self-diagnosed recovering food addict with a PhD in brain and cognitive science. The program claims to be a scientifically grounded program that teaches you a simple process for getting your brain on board so that you can finally live happy, thin, and free. I mean, sounds tempting and super legit, right? Well, let's see. So the theory behind Bright Line Eating is that certain foods are addictive and being a food addict is the primary cause of obesity. Now the company uses a supposed addiction model similar to that used by unofficial organizations like Food Addicts Anonymous or FAA, likening the process of recovery to that of overcoming like a smoking addiction. Note that this is not a legitimate validated model or treatment protocol as the mere existence of food addiction is actually still up for debate in the medical community, but more on that very soon. Like FAA, the Brightline Eating Program encourages you to cut out everything you're allegedly addicted to completely and all at once. In fact, the program takes an explicit stance against the concept of moderation. Now to encourage one to overcome their alleged food addiction, which again, I will get to soon, the program features four bright lines, which are defined as clear, unambiguous boundaries. The idea behind this whole bright line situation is that by setting boundaries, or let's be honest and call them what they are, hard restrictive rules, you will of course lose weight. Sounds like every other fad diet ever, but yeah, moving on. The bright lines are number one, obviously, no sugar, shocking I know. 
but not just the refined white stuff, but also no honey, no agave, no stevia, no truvia, no juice, no dried fruit, and no artificial sweeteners. Only whole real fruit is fine in terms of sugar. Bright line number two is no flour. And actually even flours like almond and coconut are also off limits. Susan claims that the processing and refining of flour makes it affect the brain like a drug. Now, while processed and refined flour may not be as nutrient dense, comparing it to a drug is a complete misrepresentation of any and all of the research that we have to date. And as a woman with a doctorate degree, I'm Dr. Sheldon Cooper, BS, MS, MA, PhD, and SCD. OMG, right? <laughs> One would think that she knows how to read and interpret research. But alas, here we are. Bright line number three is that you're only to have three meals a day with no eating in between. In one of her vlogs, Susan claims that by letting ourselves snack in between set meal times, we give ourselves permission to eat all day long and therefore we'll eat too much food. Ugh. Now, I know this woman has a PhD and stuff, but she does know that you can overeat at mealtimes too, right? And in fact, if we really want to get technical and fight dirty with poor science, that there's actually a slight metabolic advantage to having smaller meals more often. Yeah. Anyways, more on that faulty logic soon. But finally, bright line four is that food quantities must be heavily controlled and manipulated. This means that everything you're eating should be meticulously weighed and portioned out and you're not allowed to eat more even if you're left unsatisfied. Which, come on, you definitely would be on a boring plan like this. What bothers me the most about this bright line is not the fact that most members cite only getting around 1200 calories, which by the way, is only enough for my three-year-old toddler or doodle poppy, not a human adult, but it's the fact that Susan claims that this structure gives you food freedom. What the actual f Can we stop co-opting anti-diet rhetoric to sell obviously restrictive and borderline starvation-based diets? There's nothing freeing about being told you can't have any flour, any sugar, any snacks. Oh, and weigh your food at a restaurant and dinner party because hey, that is the food freedom way. If this is what food freedom looks like in real life, Susan, lock me up. I'm getting a little bit spicy already, but obviously there is a lot to unpack with these four pivotal bright lines. However, I also want to flag one of the most unintuitive recommendations of the bright line program, the controversial fifth bright line, so to speak. And that is that members are told not to exercise. What? Now, some sane people might justify this by saying, well, I guess they don't want a lawsuit when somebody passes out and hits their head doing a boot camp class while consuming half of their caloric needs. But obviously, that's not the rationale that Susan gives. Susan claims that exercise has no effect on weight loss and that instead, what it does is that it will burn up your willpower that you need to stick to your diet. So yeah, let's talk about this. First of all, it is true that diet is statistically a greater contributor to the weight loss equation, but it doesn't mean that exercise has no effect. One meta-analysis of the research suggested that both exercise-only interventions and those focused on exercise combined with lifestyle changes did result in fat loss and improved body composition. Another study also found that when exercise was combined with dietary changes, the individuals experienced a greater percentage of fat loss when compared to individuals who participated in diet-only interventions, and they were also able to sustain their weight loss longer than with diet alone, likely because exercise can increase muscle mass to support metabolism. And even if exercise had little effect on weight loss, which some studies do in fact show, we know that there are dozens of arguably more important reasons to move, including reducing the risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, stroke, and even mental health issues like depression and anxiety. Anyways, moving on to the meal plan. 
Now, before we dive into more detail on those bright lines, I want to take a wee look at what Susan's meal plan would suggest. So the book suggested portions for women apparently look like this, which puts most people around the 1200 calorie mark with a number of users suggesting that they don't even get to meet that. As one user shared, this is essentially what that would look like in real life. Sad, I know. Now it's worth pointing out that this unfortunate day of eating was actually a bit of a cheat day for this poor user since she also had some kind of snack of like a veggie cake which put her over her calories by 72.3. So I genuinely hope she wasn't disciplined too harshly for her diet transgression. But speaking of harsh, cruel treatment, it's important to point out that if you were to attempt this punishment of a diet while going out to like a dinner party or work lunch, you would need to make sure that you found a handbag that fit your food scale inside. Yep, you're required to weigh everything you eat, including food prepared outside the home. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty triggered just imagining having to like weigh out my cherry tomatoes in front of my colleagues or friends. So that brings me to my beef. And get settled in folks, cause there's a lot. Let's talk about the major problems with bright line eating. The food addiction model they're using is based on faulty research. So as mentioned before, Susan compares a sugar addiction to an addiction to drugs, which I've actually spoken about ad nauseum in my video right here. But let's do a really quick recap on what the evidence says. So a lot of the headlines around this concept center around research that was done on rats, which showed a dopamine response to sugar similar to that of hard drugs. There's also evidence in rats that when sugar was taken away, they exhibited signs of depression and anxiety, as well as increases in acetylcholine, like we see in substance abuse withdrawal. But evidence against the sugar addiction model suggests that while we do see a dopamine response to sugar, it doesn't have the same neural hijacking pattern that something like cocaine does. Furthermore, we see the same dopamine response to other positive non-addictive behaviors and stimuli like music, humor, seeing a loved one, holding a baby, and smiling. More importantly, the conclusions of that landmark rat study I mentioned actually found that that drug-like response to sugar was only apparent when the rats had previously been restricted of sugar. This means that when rats were able to have sugar whenever they desired, their brains did not light up the same way as they would on opioids. In fact, they responded to sugar like they would respond to any type of food. The authors say it beautifully. Intermittent access is critical to the development of binging. This paradigm promotes a form of eating under uncertainty because food availability is unpredictable. And guess what creates a perfect storm for eating under uncertainty? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a bogus fad diet with too few calories and too many rules? Oh snap. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now it's worth pointing out that other research unrelated to the food addiction model suggests that binging often follows a period of restriction. One study looking at the characteristics of individuals who struggled with binging found significantly higher levels of dietary restraint or restriction. These individuals also felt more feelings of deprivation, an exaggerated response to food, and impaired satiety cues, which really shouldn't come as a surprise if you're a regular Abby's Kitchen viewer. You might also recall me often talking about the satisfaction hunt and how deprivation is often the instigator for an innocent binge. You know, you want the ice cream you're not supposed to have, so you have the fat-free plain yogurt. Obviously, that doesn't do the trick. So you move on to the protein bar, but no, not quite. Then you eat an entire pint of that keto ice cream in the freezer before you cave and say, it and eat the whole Ben and Jerry's tub too. Had you perhaps allowed yourself to have a mindful bowl of ice cream, you could have quelled that binge and guilt cycle before it started and ultimately taken in way fewer calories in the process. I know this is easier said than done for some folks with long-standing histories of overeating and a lot of people do need more structure, 
so I don't want to undermine that reality, but I'm just pointing out that overt extreme restriction is not helpful for most people either. And in almost all cases, there can be and should be a more thoughtful middle ground. And that brings me to my next big issue with Brightline. There is no screening or protection related to disordered eating. New visitors to the website are encouraged to take the food susceptibility quiz, which contains questions related to one's food struggles within the last three months. For example, there's questions like, how much were you able to control the amount of food you ate? How much do you feel your cravings control you? How often did you binge, etc. The problem with this is that a lot of the behaviors that the quiz is asking you about are actually common disordered eating behaviors. So for example, binging and preoccupation or obsessive thoughts about food. Nowhere is it suggested to folks who check off often in these relation to these boxes that they should abort Brightline's mission and seek professional help. Rather, the solution is always one of Brightline Eating's problematic restrictive eating programs. And folks, that's not cool. So to test this out myself, I purposefully took the quiz myself and selected all the red flag options such as I experienced frequent severe binges and I received the highest score that you can get, aka I was identified as being highly susceptible to food addiction. After this, I received a promo video about how to start the program, of course, and I was given no suggestions that I may be at risk for disordered eating or to seek professional help. I also tried the opposite strategy and I selected the lowest risk options, such as I never binged and I was not preoccupied with thoughts about food. And guess what? Same spiel. What is the point of a quiz if it tells me nothing individualized about my care? Obviously, this is not a personalized program, but it's also a potentially really dangerous one considering the risk associated with another restrictive diet for somebody who is clearly struggling in the relationship with food. Which brings me to my third reason why this program needs to go. And that is the problematic disordered diet culture messages. So the first thing I want to address came up in one of Susan's videos that I came across on her website where she was talking about weighing food. Let's take a look. Structure produces freedom. Freedom from obsession, freedom from wondering if you've eaten the right amount or not. People who say, I don't want to measure my food. I say, try it for a few days. And they write me things like, Susan, <laughs> I love measuring my food so much. If I, if I experienced um, my house burning down around me, I would grab my cat and my digital food scale and run out the door. Um, you'd be surprised. It's amazing to weigh and measure your food and experience how structure produces freedom. What the actual <laughs> Now, as usual, I'm not here to diagnose anything, but that is an incredibly disordered statement to make. And it is really alarming to me that a PhD wouldn't see that as a red flag. Not only is this kind of dedication rewarded in the system, but as Susan says, and I quote, it's amazing to weigh and measure your food and experience how structure produces freedom. No lady, there is nothing freeing about weighing out your now, while we're on the topic of weighing food, reviewers of the program have stated that bringing their food scale to restaurants and social events to weigh out their food made them feel embarrassed. Again, this is not shocking to me. Other problematic messages that this company has been known for includes statements like, hunger is not an emergency with program materials explicitly suggesting that you ignore your hunger cues, no licks, bites, or tastes while cooking, with program members suggesting that Susan's helpful tip is to put tape over your mouth while you're cooking so that you don't accidentally lick the spoon. What the actual f Also, we can't forget about their obsession with finding the right size body, which of course perpetuates the fat phobic assumption that there is a one size fits all for health. And let's not forget about their catchphrase, live happy, thin and free. I mean, those three words cannot possibly coexist on a messed up program like this. You might be thin, but you are certainly not free. And I can't imagine that most people would be very happy either. You also do not need to be thin to find happiness, just in case you needed to hear that too. 
Now, I'm sure that with all things, this kind of tough love approach works for some people and they're able to just like do the diet and not let it interfere with their enjoyment of life. But from my research, a lot of the ex-users opened up about how the program caused serious disordered eating tendencies like binge eating. And as we've already established, the research suggests that this outcome only makes sense. Now, if I haven't already talked you out of this program, I just want to end on a more utilitarian note. And that is that Brightline is expensive as so first of all, to get started, you'll want to buy the book, which is about $25 to $30 USD. Then to do the 14 day challenge to help you plan and prep for this way of eating and living, that's going to run you about $14. Cool. Moving on. Next comes their eight week boot camp program, which costs you about $500. And believe it or not, it actually used to cost just under a grand. And when you are committed to BLE as a way of life, you get onto their subscription service for $474 per year. And if you don't sign up within three days of completing the boot camp, that price jumps to almost $950. This doesn't even take into account the added costs related to participation, like a digital food scale, plus all of the whole fresh real food that Susan recommends. And despite spending over a thousand dollars, you aren't even seeing anyone face to face. There's no access to professional support like a registered dietitian or a licensed therapist. In fact, in one of her videos, Susan says, it's not my area of expertise, nor is it the area of expertise of anyone at Brightline Eating. I got 27 employees and none of us are an expert in nutrition, not even close. Uh, shouldn't that be a red flag? So to summarize, do not waste your hard earned cash on a problematic and dangerous program like Brightline Eating. It's based on faulty science, preys on folks who have likely disordered relationships with food who could benefit from legitimate professional help and not only doesn't actually help them, but it could very well make their health much worse. Is losing a quick 10 pounds really worth all that? I think not. So on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you again to Built Bar for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, please be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next or what you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye. And for more great videos like this, check out the link right here.